Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar of organized by Trophy on safety in women's mobility, which is a worldwide topic. This is part of a, so, of a series of webinars that we at Trophy we are organizing to open the discussions on some relevant topics related to the facilitation of the people mobility and more especially in this case of women. Today, the objective is to discuss an exchange on how preventive digital solutions can support women in the long term run. And in fact, women's mobility is too often limited by the fear of being sexually harassed, but also by the real insecurity. And it's pretty interesting actually to, to notice the difference. Sam Pauline, I'm a business, I'm doing business development for Trophy. And I'm also doing a PhD on right on this topic. And more precisely, I try to look at how different solutions, preventive and more or emergency focus, how how those um, solutions, digital solutions, transform the day-to-day -day life of women, and more speci specifically their mobility. And so I would be the happy moderator for this webinar. First of all, I just would like shortly to present you Trophy Association. Overall, we develop apps for public transport users and also open data for NGOs, urban planners and transport operators. And we work closely with OpenStreetMap communities to do public transport mapping. So we started some time ago in 2019, 18 and 19 officially in Cochabamba, Bolivia, and now we are internationally implemented in different parts of the globe. And we have, so we have projects in Africa, Asia, Europe, and also Latin America. And actually to sum up, we overall map informal transport. And on the top of this, we create this app, a mass application. So in this webinar, we have invited two amazing speakers which are so who are Ankita Kapoor from Safety Pin and Debavi Ranimak from Red Dot Foundations. And so this app, Safety City, she will tell us more about it to share so the work on safety for women and more generally for all in public space and public transport. And there are actually two people that I, that I already know for some times. And that I was glad to, to ask to join us. So first of all, Ankita will give us a presentation about safety pin. Actually, Ankita, I met her last year uh, doing my research, asking for more content, more explanation about what was safety pin about. So she will tell us today um, more about safety pin. So she is program manager and she's based as the, as the, um, the organization in Gurugram in India, which is very close to Delhi. She has a background in architecture and urban planning, and also her work focuses on project management, research, data analysis. And so she works with authorities and other type of organization to create safer, safer, sorry, and gender inclusive public space. Ankita, the floor is yours. Pauline. Uh, am I audible and visible? Uh, wait, I stop sharing. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. I am Ankita. Uh, thank you, Pauline, uh, for giving me this opportunity. I hope uh, I am clearly audible and you are able to see me. Hello. Um, yes, okay. Ankita, I'll, we can okay. hear you. Okay, fine. I'll just uh, pull up my slides. One second. Okay. Can you uh, can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. So basically, today I will be talking about how at Safety Pin we use data and technology to enhance mobility and safe, safer mobility for women. But before we dive into that, it's important to understand 
that the travel patterns of men and women are significantly different. It's important to understand how women move. Women often indulge in trip chaining, that is they make multiple stops, they travel with their kids or other dependents, they may travel in peak hours, off peak hours, they may use public transport, walk uh, or use other, uh, you know, supporting transport, uh, paratransit facilities which we call them. While men on the other hand usually take longer trips and they often travel in peak hours. So fundamentally this there is a difference in how women and men move. And this needs to be acknowledged in the way our cities are planned and the public transport in the cities are planned. So if I talk about India, this is some of the data from the census of 2011, which shows that a lot of women, like about 30% of women in India still walk. And a significant number of women are also dependent on some or other mode of public transport like buses or paratransit for their daily commute. And this data also shows that a lot of women do not move at all. And there are, our studies have shown that there are different factors which kind of, you know, are responsible why women are not able to move, are not able to travel. And we will discuss some of those here today. So when we talk about a public transport journey, it's, it's very important to understand that public transport journey is comprises of four different legs. So the first is from your home or your origin to the bus stop or the metro station or the railway station. Then the next leg is while waiting for the mode at the terminal at the station. Third is boarding and alighting at the vehicle and fourth is the final experience inside the vehicle. So lack of safety in any of these parts of a journey could discourage women from using public transport. Now sexual harassment uh, as Pauline also mentioned is a is a ubiquitous phenomenon and it's an everyday reality in many cities. A recent uh, study done by ORF study uh, foundation in 140 Indian cities show that 57% women feel unsafe while using public transport. The, the statistics are almost similar even in cities globally. In a survey in 2018 by the Greater London Authority, 86% women said that they feel unsafe while using public transport. So in order to be able to uh, design cities which are equally accessible to all and which uh, where everybody can have equal right to the city. It's important that we make cities and design cities keeping in mind all the different users in the city, especially women. So to this, we at Safety Pin work towards our mission where we want to build a world where everyone can move around without fear, especially women and other groups. We are a social enterprise and a technology platform where we work with cities and communities and collect data on safety related parameters on walkability accessibility and share this data with other stakeholders in the city to assist them to improve the city infrastructure and services and make them more inclusive for everyone we use different tools for data collection the three apps that we currently have are the my safety pin app safety pin night and safety pin site app i will explain a little more about these apps as i go ahead in the presentation so far, we have collected data in more than 75 cities across 16 countries. We have worked with several uh, city governments in India and even globally. And we've also worked with uh, many bilateral agencies and development banks. So the first application is called the My Safety Pin app. It is uh, an app which is a public app and it's available for free on both the Play Store as well as the App, uh, app Store. And it is used basically to collect crowdsource data. Uh, it is a tool or a platform, you can say, where users can assess public spaces and share their concerns of mobility through this app. The app has a, a very important feature, which is called the safety audit feature. So basically, safety audit is a tool which is used to assess safety in public spaces. In the My Safety Pin app, we have nine parameters to rate a public space and some of these parameters are about physical infrastructure like for example lighting, walk path and public transport. Then there are some other parameters which look at how the space is being used socially. So how many people are walking on the street, how many women or children are also available in that area or are or also walking or using that space. Are there any vendors or other uh, you know, uh, street activities happening on the streets? All these parameters are measured. Then we have a parameter called feeling, which is a subjective parameter. And this is used to uh, 
then the feeling uh, parameter can be is a subjective parameter so there is no defined uh, rubric or you know guidelines to it the person perception of safety can vary from one person to the other based on their age their gender their familiarity with the location where the audit is done or even their past experiences so like i was saying this is the safety audit feature once a user clicks on the do safety audit uh, on the home screen of the app they are navigated to the nine parameters where they rate all the parameters they can also take pictures and write in their comments and once an audit is submitted it appears as a pin on the home screen and the color of the pin indicates whether a place is safe or unsafe so the red color pins show that the place is unsafe while the green pins show that the place is safer there are some other features of the app that i would also like to you know briefly talk about there is a nearby feature so anybody can use this feature and you can uh, know about your nearby parks transport hub public toilets in your locality of course you can do the safety audit and see the safety score then a person can enable the you know can enable the tracking feature and here if someone is feeling unsafe or they are feeling vulnerable they can use this feature and get themselves tracked by their family member or friends and lastly we have a safest route feature so which provides a uh, safe distance the route safest route between two points like for example google provides us the distance based the route based on time this is based on the existing safety pin data so between two points uh, based on safety pin data a safest route will be given by this app we have other two tools which are used for data collection the first is the safety pin night app so this app is used for detailed large scale city wide data collection a phone with the my safe uh, with the safety pin night app is mounted on the windscreen of a vehicle and as the vehicle moves in the city images are getting collected so the focus here is on the pavement and the street light the photographs that are getting collected look at the condition of the pavement whether they are built obstructed or how easily can one walk on them then the condition of street lights are they available or do they work are they broken then also it looks at the activities happening on the pedestrian on the walk path so if there are vendors there are there any shops or kiosks around the walk path and more recently we have developed a third app which is called safety pin site app it is used to conduct detailed assessment of public spaces and services so like this there is a form that we build on the app and using this form we assess a public space like a bus stop or a market place or a public transport another hub using these different questions you can also take in photographs here and all the all the three apps all the data that is collected is geotag so this really helps us to collect large scale data and then share it very efficiently with other stakeholders basically using our three applications we collect data and we want to use this and we use this data to be to help stakeholders to improve city infrastructure improve lighting in the city physical uh, walkability in the city and enhance mobility all these factors which are responsible for anyone to feel safe in the city especially women so when we work with stakeholders we want we help them to make impact in the city so that everyone can equally access the city especially women and other vulnerable groups now i'd like to quickly focus on some of our work on gender and urban mobility we have been working closely with the city of delhi since 2014 in 2016 we mapped the entire city of delhi and identified about 7500 dark spots dark spots are the points where there is absolutely no lighting they are completely dark and we shared this data along with our recommendations to the delhi government and other stakeholders many stakeholders in the delhi government and based on our recommendations changes were made in the city's lighting conditions new street lights were installed the existing lights were improved and in 2019 we were uh, commissioned by the government to do a remapping and this time as you can see the number of dark spots reduced drastically so this way uh, in delhi we have been able to measure the impact uh, of the change in the lighting parameter using the safety pin tools we also periodically assess other public stops in the city such as metro station bus stops to identify what are the key concerns around these public transport hubs that make women feel vulnerable 
in another study with the FIA Foundation we did in 2019, we looked at three low-income communities in Delhi and Chhattisgarh region to understand how young girls and women navigate through public spaces. And one of the key findings of the study was that poor infrastructure is a is a barrier for a lot of girls in public spaces. So be it poor lighting, be it poor walkability, poor walk paths around public toilets. or poor walk paths around transport hubs all these things uh, deter women from using public spaces especially after night apart from physical infrastructure the social environment also plays a major role uh, to understand uh, you know and, and to help to to play, plays a major role to decide how girls and women will use public spaces for example uh, in one of the studies we saw that in Uh, i think in north north delhi we had a place called bhavana where we did the study and we saw that though there was infrastructure in terms of parks but girls would seldom use those places because those were frequently used by men and girls feared that they would the men would pass comments on them and they would you know the 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 girls felt that they did not belong to the place so the social environment also plays a very important role the study highlighted that basically lack of safety and safe mobility choices and the fear of constant fear of sexual harassment and gender based violence in public spaces is a barrier for growth opportunities for girls and women we saw that parents were reluctant to send their girls to schools or for higher education if they felt that the streets were unsafe for them girls and women themselves didn't want to use public transport because they felt that they were overcrowded and uh, there could be instances of sexual harassment with them in the buses in many cases we also saw that the girls were uh, were you know willing to just uh, stay around their neighborhood they would want they wanted to study in their area they wanted to work only close by near to their homes so that they didn't have to travel far off uh, and use public transport in the city even if that meant that they had to let go of good uh, employment or educational opportunities we did another uh, study in tier 2 cities these are the two Tier two cities in Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan, the two states in India, and we found that the similar findings we found here that girls felt very unsafe in public spaces uh, and public transport, and even while waiting for public transport. Some of the reasons included overcrowded public transport, almost uh, empty public transport, poor lighting, lack of uh, police patrolling in that area. uh they've also worked with bagota since 2016 and in 2016 when we mapped the city we found uh that based on our data we were able to suggest uh, recommendations so that where new lights could be put up where uh, the locations for cctv cameras and places where bike stands could be put up so in based on our data and recommendations the city made these changes and in 2019 they asked us to do a remapping and this time we were able to see that more women were using public spaces there were more people more women especially out in public spaces who were not only using public spaces but they were they were using bicycles they were using modes of public transport for their everyday mobility uh, more recently uh, in 2021 in collaboration with the world bank we did a safety and accessibility mapping of the arikandua brt corridor in tau kolo and we used our safety pin site tool for this assessment and using the tool we were able to assess the infrastructure at and around the bus stop and we also conducted uh, user test user surveys user testimonials collected user testimonials where we spoke to users of the public transport stops and asked them what are the things that made them feel unsafe or that would encourage them to use public transport so these are some of the findings as you can see that based on our application from our application we were able to find out that there was no shelter or seating at the bus stops the lighting was poor and no cycling infrastructure or any other last mile connectivity options were also available so to just conclude i would say that we need a few things if we want to build safe and inclusive mobility of course first is to be able to really understand that the needs of all users in the city is not same women elderly children they 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 behave and they work and they move in a in a, in a certain fashion as compared to male so we need to design for everyone universal access design is very important good street infrastructure in terms of lighting walkability is important and supporting services and amenities like street furniture public toilets are also important so that 
especially for uh, people with limited mobility like people who are uh, working or people who are walking with el uh, with children or who are carrying groceries or handbags it's important that they have then they find spaces where they can rest and so that they understand that the city also belongs to them and they're able to use those public spaces and i think it's very important when we talk about safety in public transport or in mobility it's not just like i mentioned before it's not just the public transport mode itself but also first and last mile connectivity once a person gets down from the public transport they should be able to find a safe mode for their commute back home at all times of the day and institutionally we need effective redressal mechanisms to fight gender based violence and i think uh, if we want more women to be users of public transport we must ensure that there is enabling mechanism so that more women can also uh, participate in the transport sector they are there as uh, transport operators transport drivers conductors and even in the transport sector as decision makers so to to help do this uh, we have recently come up with a framework which we call the she rises framework where rises is an acronym for responsive inclusive safe and equ equitable cities and we have made this framework to kind of assist city governments and other stakeholders so that they can understand their current gender responsiveness and work towards uh, improving themselves and becoming more gender responsive there are different four pillars and streams in this uh, framework and one of the most important features is mobility and transport which which specifically looks at the needs of uh, and the con which looks at the needs of women and other user groups and also looks at the availability of different facilities which have been provided by the public transport department in the system so i think i'll stop here for now and then i can take if there are any questions later thank you thank you a lot ankita it was amazing safety pin is doing so much work and it's so interesting the way how so brilliant the way how you use crowdsourcing and the way you collect data and all the reports you do. For the question, so it will come after the presentation of Vebavi, but actually in between. So how say now is the presentation of Vebavi, and after that there will be five pres uh, five minutes presentation by my colleague from Trufi Leo, who is going to tell us more about how Trufi could implement those two solutions, run by Safety Pin and by Red Dot Foundation in our um, trophy solution and so now i would like to present uh, vibavi and ask vibavi on the on the stage vibavi is a friend that i met some times ago and <laughs> and in so in pune because i do my research in pune so we met there several times and i'm happy to, to present you so vibavi is a project and outreach manager at Red Dot Foundation based in Pune, so, and uh, um, has a background in gender, law, and social justice. She worked closely with marginalized community like prostitutes and sanitary and workers, and also bringing awareness about gender-based violence through trainings, materials, as well as ground field actions. Which so she is going to tell us more about it. So Vibhavi, that's you. Turn. Thank you so much, Pauline. A pleasure to be here and uh, see you again. Um, hi everyone. My name is Vibhavi, and um, I am a project uh, and program officer from Red Dot Foundation. So the work that we do is uh, extremely vast, but I will try my best to um bring it down to a presentation and hopefully have more conversation around it as well um with the kind of work that we do so i will just present my screen now let me know if it is sharing yes it is all right okay so red dot foundation is um, an organization a non-profit organization that works within the intersection of gender justice technology urban design and community engagement um i am based out of pune and we have a close group of 15 to 18 people who work together and all of us work on uh, extremely different projects but are aligned towards the same um, idea and the mission uh, that is with the uh, safe city 
the programs are aligned with uh, GBV inter intertwining with uh, gender sensitive communication, safety communication, um, sexual reproductive rights, legal remedies, data, group healing, self-defense, entrepreneurship, and a lot more to um, get into the details. I would like to introduce to you the application, the platform that we work on uh, through who it is that we engage with, what it is that the application does, and then how do we circle it back to the community that crowdsources and gives us the data? So just to introduce to you the campaigns that we have, have broadly kept it in three categories. One is the community campaigns where we bring together people who are from, um, who have some kind of a relativity factor, say same economic group, same cultural group, same regional group, social group, because GBV, gender-based violence and sexual-based violence around these communities will be uh, similar. So it becomes easier for us to understand that. That is with our community programs. We have a lot of programs with young people and youth, which is uh, one of my favorite parts of being with Red Dot Foundation, meeting young people every day and understanding new or innovative ways of um, interacting with the data that uh, we have on safe city uh, and then of course there, there are special campaigns with experts where we um, uh, engage in conversations and research work with um, economists um, law enforcement agencies we also have um, government um, um, officials involved in the process so this is pretty much the broad areas of the campaigns that we have in order to implement or bring together safe city because what we realized was with gender-based violence a lot of people lack information on what it is to be safe in a inclusive and inclusive environment and what are the factors that give opportunity for public places to become a dangerous space or non-inclusive, non-safe, um, non-sustainable non -sustainable space. So we start our work and we've extensively started our work um, with trainings and with education and awareness programs. That's how we uh, build uh, the people's capacity who are going to go ahead and report on the Safe City platform. Now, the idea of Safe City platform comes from the fact that we wanted one space where you can see or map what is happening in Canada, right? But as researchers have showed initially as well, 80% of women who'd want to report about a gender-based violence will not do it with the fear that their name is attached to it. Uh, it may come back to them, their job will go. Um, like uh, my colleague Ankita was saying, a lot of mobility goes away. Like for the students who are scared of reporting, their parents will take them back and they'll be like, okay, no, no school, no tuition for you. So a lot of people are really scared about the fact that I want to report, but I don't want my name to be involved. So Safe City as a platform is a space, it's a web app. Uh, it's available on Android and Play Store as well um uh apple and play store as well the application allows you to report an anonymous report on this platform about something that happened to you and pinpoint it to the location geolocation map it and say that this to the level of street um on google maps and the best part of this is that it's not taking your email id it is not taking your name it is definitely not taking your IP address as well because you really have to go down to the street level and then zoom in and then map it up. So uh, we really wanted to understand and respect the space of privacy with people and then give them a platform to still raise their voice. So I think a lot of you might have a question that, okay, if somebody is reporting and their name is not there, they're also reporting against somebody whose name is also not involved, then what it is exactly WebAV that you guys are working on? we are specifically just working on the aggregate of the data that comes and try to figure out how this particular space turned out to become a breeding ground to a sexual offense and that too has categories there are some places which are extremely which become a hot spot for um physical type of gender-based violence some become a, a hot spot for a verbal type of gender-based violence so there are a lot of different um, categories that we will go into as well that safe city provides so our idea was to understand what exactly is it that is giving the opportunity for this public space to become unsafe and there are many many factors that i will come to as well so you can see these, this is what the hot spots look like so 
if you can see, you can see two zero two uh, one zero four. What are these numbers? These numbers, if you click on them, if you zoom in, you can exactly read the report written by a person verbatim. So the data is crowdsourced and it is open to access to everybody. So say if I'm traveling from Pune to Mumbai and I'm going at a at a particular hour to this particular space i can zoom in and see what are the current um, affairs that are going around there i can I, I don't even have to zoom in i can see it on the dashboard and see okay at this point of time on this day of the week this type of sexual offense is what is recurring in this place so i will probably try to keep myself safe so that's an individual perspective on the application as well this is what the dashboard looks like um and this is just a simple overview of what it looks like I will um, I will I will go through okay I can share my screen here I'm showing you the live uh, dashboard of what it looks like this data is collected and it has to be put to use somewhere so this is what the data looks like according to categories of um, uh, uh, GDV then we have uh, subcategories of say if I want to see um, indecent uh, incidences of indecent exposure or stalking so that gets categorized again so I can see an overview of the city, like I was showing you. Most amount of uh, incidences are catcalls and whistling. Least come to, you know, rape uh, or petty robbery. And we had to put petty robbery and chain snatching in it because we saw that these were recurring um, complaints that kept coming. Although this has nothing to do with gender-based violence, but we realized that this is also another recurring factor that is making women um, um, and People just feel unsafe in places. So you can see category wise distribution. This is verbal abuse, physical abuse, and you can see what is happening when. Then we also have another indicator for time. So this is the time of the day, right? This is quarter uh, 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 of the day. This is how you can see that, okay, fine. At 1, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., verbal abuse is at a peak and i will show you why all of these very um, um nitty gritty uh, information is important then you can see area wise uh, uh, there are 97 comments on um verbal abuse in bandra whereas there are 110 in borivali and then you get a street view as well again right so i wanted to take you through uh, the dashboard to let you know that this is the kind of information that comes out of crowdsourcing this data which again goes after training people on understanding and identifying gender based violence and like i was saying i we have in the last one year we have worked with youth um, and this were i think 250 participants and these are the backgrounds that they had come from um now that we have so much data that is collected and such rich data with uh, very specific um, uh, uh, categories, then we try to reuse this data with different age groups of people, different stakeholders. Like I was saying, youth engagement is a huge part of it. We throw hackathons and we throw um, 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 uh, studio labs where students can come together, engage with the data and come up with solutions. And when I say solutions, I want you to I want you to not think of something great and be like, okay, fine, now GBV is gone. I'm saying hyper-local solutions, solutions that are extremely important for that group of people or will serve that very problem. And that's what our motive has been for a very long time. So one of the solutions, I really wanted to also highlight some of the good stuff that the students have done because I really love uh, working with the students. As you can see, some of the students who had participated in the challenge last year, said that the data that you have is so complex to understand and grasp that we need somebody to visualize it in a manner which is even more um, easily translated to other people. Data and everything can be huge, right? So they came up with comics and they have used verbatim um, uh, incident reports, as you can see in places, uh, as you can see on the map as well. But um, they've also graphically put it in a way that is more is is easily translated uh, another thing that comes out of uh, understanding this data and collaborating and working with students and other agencies that we come up with handbooks because we've realized that um training once may not be enough so we come up with toolkits we have come up with uh, this is a this is a snakes and ladder game which is in i think it's it's in marathi here but um, it's a game to understand um, child sexual abuse 
um, navigation, um, case navigation. And then we have uh, LGBTQ community workforce um, uh, toolkit as well, and then cyber law uh, toolkit as well. When we look at solutions that are born out of the data, I want you to know that most of these solutions are simple, cost efficient, and easily applicable. Again, hyper local and something that can fix the problem right now. Um, one of the solutions could be, as you can see, this girl, she's from Delhi. Uh, we had a similar problem uh, with uh, um, a group of girls in Delhi where uh, they had, uh, they were trying to go to their school and back, but they had to cross this alley, which was uh, really dimly lit and um, had dark wall and everything. So what we did was that we went there. We got a lot of reports from there. So that became a hotspot. And now it is for us to go ahead and um, do a social audit there. So we went ahead. We spoke to the community. We understood what the girls wanted. We had to sit down the girls and train them about GBV, about how to report uh, a kind of a process to um, bring resilience in them in order to understand that they can reclaim their space. Second thing that we had to do was that uh, we realized that once we went to that specific place, we saw that one lights are dimly lit, like Ankita was saying, one of the biggest problems is that lights are really dimly lit. And it kind of like psychologically makes you a little more fearful of entering that space. Walls were gray. And there was a huge garage, which was empty, right in front of the alley. So just a question, what happens when usually public places are left unattended? Who occupies it first? It's always the men, right? So it was very similar that happened there. When we went there, we saw kids, uh, boys, young boys sitting there playing cards, laughing, giggling, and that definitely could impact the psychology of the girls. Um, so once we trained the girls, we also sat with the boys and we asked them, uh, what it is that they are doing and we also translated what the girls had complained to us you would not believe that most of the men did not know that just their presence and occupying a public space or maybe just laughing loudly could make another girl feel uncomfortable it was it was a novel idea for them to understand that and it was very important to educate them and make them aware of uh, what were their privileges there as well right so those trainings happened and we were we were um, uh, we were ready to take a second round of um, you know survey and seeing whether the place is comfortable or not and that's when one of the girls and uh, she is in the picture she came up and she was like i want to do something for uh, the community in this organization uh, in this uh, locality we were like okay fine what is, what it is that you want to do she said that we want to paint this wall we were like okay go ahead and paint this wall not a big problem it's a small intervention it will be amazing using art as a way to stand against gbv so this group of girls they have come up with the idea of drawing eyes on the walls and uh, below um, it's written in hindi but i'll translate it to you and let you know it's written nobody likes it when they get stared at right and they have drawn huge eyes all across the wall so that was enough for them to not only reclaim their space also send across a message and all of this happened with the data that we found on safe city so not only the girls went back to their um, uh, tuitions their universities the men understood their privilege so that's what i'm saying that when we speak about solutions drawing out of um, uh, the da the data that is collected it can really be extremely hyper local it can own it can also be something that just Im uh, affects the immediate um, uh, uh, um, community and that is enough so what we realized when we were collecting data, training women, we also realized that we want to keep a long term relationships with everybody who's engaging with the data that we have. So then we started coming up with community champions and community leaders because we have a short uh, is a small team, a small, uh, cute little team that is uh, spread across everywhere. But we are so well connected with some 200 plus volunteers that we have on ground. And I kid you not, there have been interventions that have taken place without us even being there. Why? Because the students have taken it as uh, a space, uh, uh, as an initiative for themselves to go ahead and intervene um, in these spaces. And that not only uh, helps us to reach out to more people, it also helps helps us bridge the gap between so many people who do not have mobile phones or space in the mobile phone or internet connectivity to be able to report on our application. 
so that's when the volunteers come into place they go her they go around they take surveys they sit down uh, with people they educate them so that's that's a regenerating solution that is coming out of safe city and the um, um ultimate theme that we have and of obviously we come up with safety policies as well there's data design urban place planning as well that is happening so through and through i just wanted to also share a few testimonies of the work that we've done but the idea still remains that uh, collection of data on this platform uh, and then reusing it and also introducing the platform to the people has been extremely different for us because we specifically work on gender based violence we also recognize that a lot of people who come on these platforms may come to look for a solution for their particular problem so what we have done is that this application also has a space for you to find your nearest hospital find your nearest police station and also if you are willing to connect or if you are willing to file a report a legal report then we also provide you with organizations based out of in your city um, who can route who can help you out with the procedure so i think it's it's a it's a well rounded project and we have at the moment received more than 50000 reports all across the world we are working on a project extensively with a lot of countries right now and it's amazing and super fascinating for me because i am now with the work that safe city does and red dot foundation does i am able to understand the patterns of crime in different cities and different communities different countries and also the solutions that come up are very hyper local like i was saying so it's been a great uh, uh, space to engage with it's been a great space to learn from and uh, like um, Pauline was saying the work that we do um, in urban spaces in rural spaces as well is derived from uh, the ideas thoughts and efforts put in by a lot of people in the community uh, by a lot of people coming from different marginalized spaces as well and we would like to take this opportunity to respect them and um, thank them for all the work that they're doing and uh, the 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 work that they take forward with us and with safe city as well and with that i will stop sharing i will share the link of our uh, platform on uh, the application uh, on on the streaming platform right now so that it's easier for you also to navigate through but um, yeah we would like to know more about what are your thoughts on our presentations and i, I was i was really excited to hear more from ankita as well because i think this is the first time that i'm uh, uh, properly sitting down and listening to the work that they have done and we've heard so much about them so congratulations for all the good work that safety pen is also doing i think we're all going towards the same um mission at the end yeah over to you pauline <laughs> thank you for that indeed both organization safety pen and red dot foundation do parallel work and actually lots of complementary work also red dot foundation is doing so much i'm so impressed by this like uh, collection of data through like uh, crowdsourcing with red um hot hot spots that at the end you actually what you take actions you go there and you find out solution which i found very interesting and it it it, it does complement safety pin so that was my <laughs> one of my objectives today and uh, so you meet that you meet each other And so now I leave the floor to Leo who is going to present to us how how Trophy has to like could implement those solutions because in in grants that we are applying and in anyway in our main ideas we have this um, we have this plan of actually uh, going for more safety. So Leo the floor is yours. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me, Pauline? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I will present myself. I'm Leonardo Gutierrez. I'm part of the Trophy team. I'm, I'm working in business development, especially in in Latin America. I'm based in Colombia. And I want to share today one of the of the projects of Trophy. and that have relation with the with the previous presentations um but for us all i want to uh, acknowledge uh, to 
Ankita and Bahabi because we 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 found in our work in Trufi that the quality is is very important and uh, the behavior in, in the public transport system of the woman is definitely different, like explained Ankita, and uh, we want to contribute from from our organization and definitely we need to learn a lot uh, from people like uh, Ankita or or Bahabi. Wonderful presentation, thanks. I will share my screen now, and I want to uh, present our project. It's, it's a project we, uh, in, in, in Trufi, we work uh, mainly uh, creating public transport lines and um, offering uh, information for public transport in, in, in the global south, mainly in an informal public transport system. But recently, we start to work with this organization with the TUMI, the program of TUMI Data, uh, with uh, New Urban Mobility Alliance and Mobility Data Hub, and, and, and CAF, uh, the organization from Latin America, uh, to create a platform, a um, flexible platform, to um, obtain reports of uh, related with mobility, especially, uh, but also uh, reports related with, uh, with uh, with uh, sexual assignments or this kind of thing from from women uh, is is part is very important and was part of the project for the reason I want to share. Um, the the approach of this of of this uh, requ request to uh, collect information from our side was create a um, a WhatsApp chat. Um, I will share my screen now the a small video of a, uh, of a chat uh, we made this chat uh, with a local ally called rumbus from from colombia uh, they had experience in create chatbots and uh, and, with the, and with the trophy team we create um a chatbot in whatsapp whatsapp is very popular in, in colombia almost everyone have whatsapp in colombia and uh, we um, we share we create a, a chatbot that collect information uh, in general about mobility in the city of Bogota and also in the city of Cuenca in Ecuador. It is it's, it's in Spanish the, the chatbot, and uh, the idea is that the people in any moment can uh, start a conversation with the chatbot and. Um, the chat can uh, collect this information and put this information organized uh, for the authorities to take actions in some moments. Um, we collect, it's very important, collect the location of the, of the problem and some picture also uh, uh, if, if it's the case, in the, for example, in an in a accident or something. Um, we create uh, or we, we connect all the information with our table um, base is is very is very um, useful for the authorities and can see very easy all the reports in a, in a platform and they can also see if the if the user collect pictures or videos the authorities can see the information very very fast um, and also, we focus in in the locations. We create also a, a dashboard that indicates uh, every every report in a map. We create heat maps and other reports, uh, and and we can uh, and we can select uh, a specific uh, kind of type of, of report. For example, here. And see all the st stats related with that. We have also only five. This is a test, a test for the moment, um, and and we can see and filter all the all the um, reports uh, by the type of report, the category, and uh, the authorities have this information to to, to take action or. A community uh, project. Not only the authorities can connect this information and maintain this information, maintain um, a connection with the users of the public transport of the citizens on, in, in some place, 
And uh, in the case of Bogota, we are talking that the, the, even the police can report the, the, the problems in the in the streets. And the Secretary of Mobility thinking in obtaining information uh, with a special um, value from the even from the police. Um, we design the all the all the behavior of the of the chatbot to be flexible. It's meaning that in a city need to focus on special things like uh, um, for mobility or for the, a crime or something. The city can uh, change very fast in even in 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 a table. It can change uh, very fast the categories. Uh, this is the list of the categories, and the people can and the, and the city can change this this uh, list of category and easily change the behavior of the chap. Um, that's that's the 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 project. And thanks for for listening to me. Thanks, Valin. <laughs> Thank you. So now we go to the questions. And I have to say that some of them were already answered through the chat, but maybe I can start with the one from Ted. Oh yeah, thank you. Do you aggregate report? Reports get shared. Do aggregate reports get shared with transport operator to perhaps identify a repeat offend the driver or to alert a driver to be vigilant in certain areas. And I think this is Thank actually a, sorry, an answer for both of you. <laughs> Please go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. I was just typing the answer to this to Ted, so it's very fresh in my mind. Um, with Safe City, you cannot identify who has reported or who the report is against. The work is done as a collection. Everything is taken as a collection uh, or a solution for a group. So what we have figured out in public, and I would like to just quote this example in like two minutes, we had a... Uh, uh, we had a hotspot in Bombay, which was right outside um, a public transport. It was a station area, and we had a lot of reports coming from there. So uh, like we do every month, there's a dashboard that is created uh, with all the reports that have come up in that month, and we send it across to the police station. So we identified this hotspot, and we sent it to the police station, and the police station was surprised to see. Now, again, you can't work on individual cases because, again, anonymity is the big, biggest um, key factor of safe city. What the police station was able to report was that the maximum amount of cases of sexual harassment were coming from, take a, take a random guess, what would be the time where a lot of uh, GBV was happening? It was not my time. <laughs> not the answer. <laughs> I'm not answering. <laughs> oh, it's okay, it's okay. It was not my time. It was around 12 o'clock to two o'clock in the noon. And that was surprising for the police uh, officials because they were surprised by the idea that we allocate more personnel at night because it's going to be unsafe and this and that. But they forgot that a lot of GBV happens around crowded areas. So now they had to allocate more personnel and CCTV cameras and this, that um, safety mechanism, security mechanism. So that's what I'm trying to say is the idea with safe cities that we don't help you out with a single person solution or find a single offender. We look at how to eliminate opportunities for people to actually come here and harass you. So that's what the theory of um, change, which uh, Red Dot Foundation works on, is based out of just a working on the collectivity of uh, the impact. Over to you. Yeah, I think uh, even with safety pin, the way we work, the idea is largely to be able to prevent these crimes or any sort of gender-based violence in public spaces. So like we largely also look at crowdsourcing and other methods. So we want to improve the city environment, the city physical infrastructure, be it lighting, be it walkability. So in that way, or even the transport, uh, system 
so in that way we want to help the stakeholders and you know even uh, be, work with the people with the citizens in the city and to help them make a space build a place where where there is no crime so where we don't have to tell women that you shouldn't be out you know at this time of the day or you know you shouldn't come out alone you should travel with someone who you can rely on so that's the thing so, and for that very reason itself we also don't really believe too much in the power of cctv though we know that it's an enabler in some way but definitely it's not to prevent crime it can just help to maybe get uh, you know hold of the perpetrators fast but it doesn't really help to reduce the problem and of course there are added uh, privacy concerns uh, also to add to what you are asking ted so like we were doing a project with the dtc the delhi transport corporation and uh, recently we are doing that project it's still not over so in the project we have assessed public terminals two two of bus terminals in delhi and as part of the assessment we used our tools the safety pin site tool which we used to assess the infrastructure both inside and outside the terminal and apart from that we also conduct you know uh, qualitative uh, research so we speak with the the transport operators in this project we spoke with the conductors the drivers even the marshals that the delhi buses have now and other both men as well as women so in these ways we are able to kind of uh, understand from them also as to what is their mindset and how do they think and how do they perceive the role of women right now in the transport sector so though both of them are both men and women work in the transport sector in delhi i mean women to some extent but when you speak to both the groups separately you do see that there are women still are not very uh, very welcome sometimes in the sector and there still needs to be things that have to be done to make sure like gender sensitization trainings are done periodic assessments are done to ensure that it's not just how you have to treat your colleague in a workspace but also how you need to behave or how you need to kind of respond when a person in your bus is uh, is not comfortable or i mean you have to create that enabling mechanism that a person should be able to you know come to you or uh, kind of be able to raise their voice and say that something is not okay so that's that's largely what we do also look at thank you for that um for those informations there is a question from estefani from your experience do you see these hyper local solutions replicable to be applied on a broader scale the answer is yes I think it's already the case, no? Because you deploy it in at least, yeah, both of you. Also, yes. yeah. Both yes, of you. I think it's it's very it's very much replicable because the the methodology is pretty much the same, and we still look at the same set of parameters. Uh, of course, based on the local context, we do modify our. methodology and the way we collect data a little bit more like for example if you think of kolkata if, if i think the audience some of you may already know about the city so it's a very pedestrian oriented city there are a lot of pedestrians there are walk paths built almost all across the city but then uh, they are are not walkable in terms of either they are encroached or there are too many vendors on the streets but we also want vendors to be on the streets because they add to the natural surveillance in the street so uh, in case of kolkata when we look at safety we do not always look at physical safety i mean the perception of safety in delhi is very different from the perception of safety in kolkata so when we look at kolkata we also try to understand safety from a road safety perspective sometimes and maybe in delhi that's not the case so in so, so this it's it's very much replicable to answer your question the the methodology is very much replicable and have been we have been able to replicate it not only in india but in many cities globally but yes based on the local context we do uh, use more than the safety my safety pin app you also customize especially the safety pin site app we use that to really identify what are the key or the key concerns of people in that area and yeah so that's what we work with Yeah, this ended. It's a, uh, it's um, I, I, I know that safety pin was 
in many cities, but I didn't yeah. know that it was like really worldwide 70 cities. And the Bavi, we discussed about Africa cases. So you are also all over the world. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Ankita was saying. Uh, most of the uh, spaces are uh, have or may have very similar solutions based on the characteristic of the place. So if it's a transport space, um, transport locations, many just have a very similar type of a solution that will come forth. If these are washrooms or places where people generally feel more vulnerable, then the solutions that come around these places will be a little different. So definitely uh, solutions are, even if there are hyperlocal solutions, there is something that can generate over it. So it's always good to involve more and more data so that we can all come up with a standardized methodology, um, def definitely uh, accustomed to the cultures and traditions and um, socio-political space, um, and then try to replicate it in those uh, areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in we, the uh, of, uh, huh? yeah, in the case of the chatbot of Trufi, it's dependent on the city. We try to make, like our apps, we try to make that uh, the owner of the of the project uh, uh, be the city of the of the community or the local community. It's totally replicated. We have all our solution in open source. Everyone, everyone can replicate it. But our idea is that each city make their own project of the chatbot. Okay. Yeah, actually, yeah, indeed, it's um, customized by loca localization. Yeah. One quick question, but I already have the question. Oh no, it went away. Um, was a question related to open source, but those three applications among Trophy is all open source, isn't it? You can just download it and start to use it. And there is no cost. In the case of safety, it, is, it isn't. Red Dot as well. Isn't it's it? In the, the first app that I talked about, the My Safety Pin, that's a crowdsourced mm -hmm. app. My and that is available yes. for free. But the other two are safety pins proprietary app. And that's actually largely used for data collection. So there is a methodology to it. There's a way how it has to be used. So we do, uh, for safety pin site, we do provide training to, you know, people who collect data uh, for us at different public spaces. So after we do the training, then they are they are able to use the app. But the safety pin night app is the proprietary app and it's used with drivers who will go along the streets to collect data and that's not i mean easy readily available for public use so our platform uh safe city is entirely free um with collection of data as well and uh looking at the data as well uh, you can go right now and see what's happening in your city if you type your details it's entirely free and you can also look at um, we try to keep the crowdsource data as original as possible. So we also put up the reports verbatim as was said or reported by the people in order to keep uh, the emotion and um, um, the intensity of the report as is. We just categorize it more in like cat calling or physical abuse or um, um, uh, non-verbal abuse. So it is easier for you to understand. And then we also link it to the IPC laws so that in case, like Ted was asking, if somebody wants to go ahead and report, you can definitely refer to your complaint, figure out what are the IPC sections, which is the Indian Penal Code law legal sections, and then report uh, on the basis of that. That is also a category categorization that we give it to you uh, uh, readily. In, in the case Let's of <laughs> Is very fast. We we uh, release all the code on, on on the behavior of the chatbot, but there is a, some cost related for the use of WhatsApp or the channel specifically. But all the all the all the things is 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 free of the development. All right. Thank you for all those questions. I think we'll stop there because we already overpassed the time. Yep. So. Ankita, Vibhavi, and Leonardo as well. Thank you a lot for accepting, participating in this session. And I think it was actually really interesting for all of us, for you as well, because now you know each other and uh, you know the solution of each other. And it's, yeah, also uh, for trophies, um, it's really, I mean, it's something we'll go forward and try to dig in and having your your 
explanations and your work, knowing more about your work, will definitely help us to then go forward and with both of you continue the discussion. And I hope for everyone was a, was a nice time. And so I thank you a lot. And I thank wish you. you a wonderful evening for some and afternoon for others. Thank <laughs> you so much. It was Good so morning. nice to meet everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.